50 degrees outside at 16 minutes past 8 o'clock hour on this Friday, September the 1st. Chris Lenoir back with you on the Green Mountain Mornings program and joined once again on the phone by Randy Holhut, the deputy editor of The Commons, your reader-supported independent news and views source for Wyndham County. Happy Friday to you, Randy. Happy Friday. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to Brattleboro Community Television for being here to film our conversations with members of local media. These segments are sponsored by Brattleboro Savings and Loan. They are an ultra-local programming sponsor for BCTV live events and other programming. Randy, uh, we'll get to some of the stories in this week's edition of the Commons that was free on stands on Wednesday and online at commonsnews.org, but certainly something that uh, was making the rounds on social media last night uh, and in the media outlets this morning and will be in next week's edition of the Commons, no doubt. Uh, The passing of Peter Diamondstone and it really uh, doesn't, do him justice to say, I mean, what a a significant loss this is to political discourse in in the state of Vermont. I really do feel that way about him. Yes, a man who ran in every election for the last 40 some odd years and uh, for every office and (laughs) uh, really pushed the the debate and put in ideas that weren't being discussed by the major parties. You know, doing what third parties are supposed to do, just kind of uh, bring up topics that the main parties don't want to d- deal with. Now, you and I last year during the uh, election season were talking about the Liberty Union candidates uh, showing up at some of the debates, and I kind of posed the question out there. I was like, I wonder if the Liberty Union party had run its course, if they were just putting up candidates for the sake of putting up candidates. Uh, Mr. Diamondstone, hearing that, uh, asking for some airtime and, and having a very uh, good conversation with me about that. And I, I did not necessarily mean that in a pejorative sense because I wanted to acknowledge the accomplishment of the Liberty Union Party of making independent candidates, third-party candidates, viable in a, in a state like Vermont. You probably don't have the strength of the Progressive Party without the efforts of the Liberty Union Party. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And, uh, you would, and of course, you know, even though this is been a long-running feud between uh, Peter Diamondstone and Bernie Sanders, you wouldn't have Bernie Sanders without the Liberty Union Party. That's that's a very good point. You know, uh, when his presidential campaign started catching fire last year, one of the, uh, the folks from Talk Media News, who we do national hits with uh, every day here on this program, uh, called me and said, can you put me in touch with any, you know, supporters of Sanders back when he was running for state offices and things like that? And I got him in touch with Peter. Uh, And that was where the story came out about how uh, Bernie Sanders sold out (laughs) the Liberty Union Party and the the socialists left in the state. I think that was a surprise for many people in in middle America to see uh, a real socialist like uh, Peter Diamondstone. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and he was nothing but real. I, you know, one of the indelible Peter Diamondstone moments was I uh, was moderating a debate when I was at the Reformer with uh, Sabina Haskell, who was then the editor for Senate. So it was Bernie and Rich Tarrant. And Peter Diamondstone wasn't allowed to participate in the debate, but he came anyways, and he got up on the stage, and he held up a sign for the full 90 minutes and stood there in silence and would not be moved. Wow. That, and that was Peter Diamondstone. <laughs> that was Peter Diamondstone. And, and he was already, and the Liberty Union Party was already a fixture on the political landscape here in, at least in southern Vermont, from as far back as I can remember, becoming politically aware in the 80s. I, I mean, as far as the history of this, I, it really goes back a number of decades, probably even further than that, right? Well, it goes right back to 1970 when the party started as of, out of the uh, frustration over the... Republicans and the Democrats' inability to end the Vietnam War. Yeah, yeah, and and that was one of the the main points. And then you point out that uh, Bernie Sanders certainly helping his political career by aligning himself with them. Of course, a lot of people outside of Vermont might be looking at those YouTube videos of Vermont debates and Peter Diamondstone with his bushy beard, and maybe not necessarily taking him seriously. 
Uh, but he was somebody who took himself very seriously as far as those things go. Yeah, he, I mean, he was a <laughs> he was difficult. He was irascible. He could really get you get under your skin and and and, and tick you off. <laughs> but he also made great points too mm-hmm. about uh, what his beliefs, and he was unwavering in his in his commitment to socialism. And um, and uh, it came right from the from the almost from, from well came right from childhood. What do you think ultimately uh, his his lasting legacy as far as uh, Vermont politics will be? What will people remember the most about Peter Diamond Stone? I think they'll remember him for his persistence, for his uh, unwavering belief in in what in socialism and that it, as a valid political and economic system. And for creating a space for for third parties, uh, Liberty Union opened it a bit. The progressives opened it up a little bit more. I mean, and Vermont is still one of the few states that have multiple third parties. Yeah, and you think about also the consistency of message. Uh, he was saying the same things in the seventies uh, that he was saying in the two thousands, as far as uh, what he believed uh, to be best for Americans out there. How about the Liberty Union Party? Obviously, he had still been a strong influence on it, even up until uh, his later years here. Uh, are they able to sustain themselves without Peter? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of the Liberty Union Party was a, a, a Diamond Stone family business, given how many how many different generations of the family were running for various offices. And uh, a lot of the party's uh, history went up in flames when his, when his home burned down back in 2012. Right. And uh, I don't know what's what's next for Liberty Liberty Union. I mean, they've been struggling to keep their major party status, and uh, I don't know. I think now that uh, with Bernie's can- presidential campaign kind of reawakening Americans to socialism, and uh, you look at polling among young people, and they think, yeah, oh, socialism—that's not a bad thing, right? At least some of the some of the ways it could work within uh, the system that we have here for the betterment of a lot of different people, particularly on an issue like health, uh, certainly could be a, a good bit of his legacy. Uh, we'll talk about some of the stories in this week's edition of The Commons with Randy Olhut, Deputy Editor, when we come back, but you'll be seeing that obit in next week's edition of The Commons, as well as other places around town. 50 degrees outside at 21 minutes before the 9 o'clock hour. Chris Lenoir, continuing my conversation now on Green Mountain Mornings with Randy Holhut, Deputy Editor for the Commons, your reader supported. Awoo. And awoo, yes, a little Warren Zevon for you this morning, absolutely. Uh, you can read the writings of the Commons staff on commonsnews.org, uh, free on stands every Wednesday. A lot of important stories in this week's edition, Randy. Uh, the meeting last week of the folks who run the current bus system here in the town of Brattleboro and a lot of other uh, transit systems here in southeastern Vermont, asking for public input as they want to change the routes here in the town of Brattleboro. And I actually did a BCTV hit with uh, Rebecca Gagnon of The Current, uh, helping tease uh, what was going to go down at that meeting. Sounds like uh, as far as the turnout goes, it was more quality than quantity. Yeah, like, as usual, not many people, and I don't think people realize that these things happened or that they were soliciting uh surveys from the public until, of course, it's too late, and then everyone wonders what happened. But uh, we did our best to let people know this was happening, and a few people showed up and weighed in on the perennial problems of the B-Line, which is not enough service, not at the right times, at the right places. Yeah, and, and it sounds like, though, that they did get, at least the people who were there, the riders, did get some significant feedback on how they can fix some of those issues. Yeah, which would take some money and uh, and uh, a real commitment. But it's the the bus service is for a town this size is pretty good, except of course that it starts too late too late in the morning and finishes too early in the evening. Yeah, and and uh, there is uh, some good writing uh, and reporting by Wendy Levy here in this story as far as some of those challenges. Uh, with funding, obviously, you're relying on the state. Uh, when you're talking about a dollar a ride here, you're not exactly making a lot of money off the bus fares themselves, are you? Well, this is just seen as, you know, with the bus service, it's not meant to be making a profit. Right. And anyone who thinks that it's going to make a profit is, is out of their minds, because 
This is seen as, getting back to our friend Peter Diamondstone, this is a social good, uh, public transportation, and that you know we all pay, pay, pay for this uh, service to happen. And one you would think would have support in a community that is uh, eco-minded, like Brattleboro, right? Getting cars off the street. We have parking problems downtown, uh, yet it really is hard in rural communities uh, for people to extract extract themselves from their cars, I think. Even if there is a good, viable public transportation system here, you're just uh, so accustomed to getting in your car and getting where you need to go. Well, if there were a viable transportation system, we would get out of our cars. I mean, the reality is there's no bus service on, on Route 30 in the West River Valley, so you're out of luck there. There's no service beyond Route 5 going northward toward toward uh, uh, Bellows Falls. Right. And the the bus service in Brattleboro stops at 6 p.m. Right. Yeah, and, and that Route 30 uh, was one of the uh, issues that was addressed. I think the other one, and, and a place for a real uh, opportunity for the public transit system here, and this came up during the meeting, was with Winston Prouty now uh, housing so many different services on the former campus of the Austin School, uh, having a stop there and having more frequent stops there and along that area, sounds to me like uh, something that could be a real win-win. Yeah, that would certainly be useful to have the the town bus stop there on a regular basis. But, you know, the town, different things are popping up around town, and, and the bus routes have to kind of accommodate the, the changes in, in, in patterns of, of work and and play and, and settlement and uh, it's you know, bus services tend to be very slow to turn to to adapt to these things yeah they're trying they got some public input last week another public meeting happening at the end of september where they start to roll out some of this information and so if you've been considering public transportation and i think a lot of people would uh, maybe pay attention for those changes and hopefully it'll do something to help out uh, some of the uh, folks here who need better public transportation uh, one of the top stories in this week's edition of the Commons had to do with the Leland and Gray Middle and High School, and really that whole area there. When you're talking about the Wyndham, I think that's Wyndham Central, right? Am yes. I getting that right? Wyndham Central Supervisory Union and some of those radon tests uh, that were showing higher levels of radon in both a couple of elementary schools as well as a middle and high school. Now the two elementary schools uh, seem to be all clear, according to the uh, superintendent Bill Anton of that area, but persisting at the middle and high school, I guess. Yeah, and uh, with radon, the key seems to be ventilating the space to get the uh, the gas out of the out of, out of the space. I mean, since we're New England's kind of a radon uh, hub, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of spaces have elevated levels of it, and you just have to be be careful about it and uh, and keep the. Uh, Cellar spaces or you know spaces closest to the to the soil uh, vented vented so uh, it doesn't you don't have an accumulation. Yeah, and it seems like they there. It didn't seem like parents were necessarily worried that they don't have the final tests in yet on the on the middle and high school as as far as this report goes. Obviously, when it was first reported back at I think that was the beginning of the summer uh, when they first started uh, disclosing some of these issues they've had with higher than normal radon level detection in the schools and they put forth this mitigation plan seems like as far as the preliminary results go that is satisfactory enough for some of the families that are sending their students to the middle and high school yeah it seemed like the just the biggest beef was that the delay between the discovery of the problem and notifying the parents of the problem right i don't think they're going to make that mistake again (laughs) no i don't think so it sounds like they're going to be doing a continual monitoring of the Pico Curies. I don't know if you want to explain Pico Curies to the listener. Science, as, as, Gov- as Governor Shumlin used to call him. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, great reporting there by Mike on what's happening in Leland Gray, as well as when it, with uh, the latest in Act 46 here. We might actually see some movement on some Act 46 plans here in Wyndham County pretty soon. Well, you will unless Dummerston messes it up again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you not don't have a lot of faith in your hometown there, Randy? Well, the good people of my hometown have have agitated quite a bit against this against merger for the obvious reason is they're afraid of losing control over over Dummerston School. Right, and um, I mean that's kind of far up the road since this merger is about mainly just consolidating governance rather than consolidating schools. 
right? And and cons- you know maybe a bit of consolidation of programs so that there's more offerings that the uh, you know from BAMS the BAMS offerings extended to Guilford and Putney and, and Dummerston. But uh, the fear of, of loss of the of the school is, is very strong in Dummerston, and and uh, and the way this vote is set up, if one town says no, it's gone. You start from the beginning once again. It is It is set up that way, right? A, a plurality yes. of the voters in the four towns, Brattleboro, Dummerston, Guilford, and Putney, does not matter if one of those towns says no, then that kind of means they're back at, at the beginning again here. Of course, we're still a ways away from that November 7th vote. It has to be approved by the State Board of Education. That's probably not the issue so much as that as that vote. And, and I mean, Putney as well, they've had some misgivings. Brattleboro, even, you've had some people out there who have been very vocal against this unified district. So it's not necessarily a sure shot in any of the towns, I would say. No, I don't think so. But uh, you, you don't know. But the impact of Act 46 is kind of inescapable because it even shows up on the sports page. Yeah, and I definitely wanted to get to that uh, aspect of it. I mean, were you just feeling left out about all this Act 46 reporting <laughs> that was going on, so you decided to address it? No, because the... Uh, the falling enrollments kind of affects the affects the school athletics too, and the, the VPA had their meeting meeting last week uh, in uh, in Montpelier. You know, get ready for the coming season. And I was surprised at how many schools are forming cooperative teams, where you know two schools share share one team for a particular field, one team for a particular sport. And you're going to be seeing more and more of that, I think, going forward, just because there's the, the the, for a lot of the little schools, it's just not sustainable anymore. And, you know, that Division Four is set to disappear shortly as schools start merging because there's just not enough small schools to sustain it. Now explain how this uh, cooperative in, in athletic programs work, because this is not something that is a product of Act 46. This has been around for a little while. It's been around for a little while, but Act 46 kind of is accelerating it. But uh, if you have not enough kids to field a team, and your neighboring a neighboring school also doesn't have enough school students to field the team. You can petition the Vermont Principals Association. Hey, we'd like to get together and form uh, a hockey team. Mm-hmm. So, the, if the if the VPA signs off on it, say if if, if by chance Leland Gray and, and Twin Valley wants to start a, 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 a ice hockey program, they could do that. Right and, and field. A team combined with 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 uh, Leland and Gray and, and Twin Valley kids. So one could argue that in that instance, that's actually proof that consolidation of schools and resources is an effective way to broaden opportunities for students, right? Yeah, and also <laughs> for in, in the case of of sports where you really need to have a lot of kids out for it, like football. You, for some schools that really that have kids that are interested in football but don't have enough players, this is the way you'd end up having. Having a football team, and uh, you know, Oxbow was had to cancel their their season right at the last minute. That's the school up in uh, Bradford, just right. north of uh, of Hanover, and uh, in Norwich, they just they ended up with like I think eighteen kids out for football. Yeah, having a a uh, bigger pool of of students to play, and also sharing the costs of a a high equipment sport like football or hockey or any of these other sports where you're talking about a, a lot of equipment and investment, uh, this Act 46 consolidation in different districts could help uh, create more of those athletic opportunities as well, I imagine. Yeah, and, and I think we're, you know, I, I still see that uh, with, like, especially with Leland Gray and, and Twin Valley, even though they're rivals. Right. They're rivals. <laughs> <laughs> they, they still might have to, to consolidate, say, their baseball or or. Or uh, softball programs, depending on you know turnout, or or uh, so, um, soccer, maybe I don't know. Yeah, but you could you don't have to do every sport. You can pick and choose which ones you you want to do, depending on your on numbers and right. enrollment. But yeah, yeah again, enrollment is going to drive that, and maybe these uh, new unified districts will help people make those decisions, evaluate it better, and provide better opportunities. Provocative reading on the sports page in this week's edition of the Commons. Uh, we won't be uh, talking next week, Randy. So enjoy uh, the week, and uh, we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Yes, and we'll see how the the new season begins for everybody. It's uh, opening opening days today for 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 uh, field hockey. Yeah, and colonels go to Rutland. So yep, should be a good one. All right, take care. Thanks.
All right, Randy Hoyt, deputy editor of the Commons, free on stands every Wednesday online at commonsnews.org. Go there, make your contribution, become a member of the Commons family today. We'll be back to wrap up this edition of Green Mountain Mornings right after these messages.